Okay, good morning, everybody, and welcome again. Um, we just have two quick announcements before we start our second day of lectures. So the first announcement is that we had an excellent suggestion yesterday to start a Slack channel for the program. And so Greg has done that. You should all have received um, an invitation. So please feel free to set up channels for any topics of, of interest. Um, and once we get the uh, working groups going, we'll set up channels for those as well. Um, the second announcement is that we have a photographer with us today. Um, he's going to be photographing us for a story that the Simons Foundation is doing about the program. Um, so he'll be photographing us throughout the day. Um, but he's also very kindly agreed to do our group photo, um, which will be much better than me doing it with my phone, <laughs> which was my plan. <laughs> um, so let's meet um, at the stairs. You know, kind of if you keep going around where the lunch is, there's some stairs there. Let's meet there at uh, the beginning of the coffee break, so right after um, the first lecture today for the group photo. Okay, and I will now hand it over to Andrea Ferrara, who will be our moderator for the morning. Thank you very much, Rachel, and uh, good morning, everybody. So welcome to the second day of our <laughs> conference in the Cowley Summer uh, program. Uh, so we continue with this uh, introductory lectures by uh, our lecturers, and the first uh, today is Professor Priya Natarayan. She's from Yale, and uh, she is a, a, a leading expert in uh, black holes and gravitational lensing, among other things. And today she will, uh, she promised to deliver a very pedagogical lecture on basics of black hole and accretion. Thank you so much. <coughs> Thanks, Andrea. So as um, I have some students, former students in the audience. As you all know, if I start coughing, I will be fine. It may appear like I'm going to keel over and die, but I won't. <coughs> it's just allergies and so on. So um, it's a real pleasure uh, to have this opportunity to uh, talk to you all. Um, and um, Rachel and Greg told me that um, the selected summer students after a very competitive uh, process, uh, many of you have come from all over the place, but with different backgrounds at different stages of your career. So um, I took my charge to be um, outlining for you some of the sort of real basics of black holes and the accretion process with the view very much, you know, there's a lot of fun stuff about black holes, which I'm not going to talk about, because it's not relevant to our modeling for the purposes of galaxy formation or their role in modulating galaxy formation. But <coughs> so what I have chosen to do <coughs> is to give you a vignette of a few properties of black holes that are going to be relevant in terms of incorporating them into the larger framework of structure formation, larger framework of galaxy formation, either in sort of simplistic models, like the ones that uh, people like me do, which are sort of these semi-analytic models. So you know, it's a tradition that was started by Univer Kaufman, Rachel Somerville, and others. And you know, it's been a very fruitful direction. And so that's sort of where I'm going, and that's where my lectures are going. So I'm setting up why and how I'm going to be modeling black holes um, <coughs> the way we do for those techniques. And it turns out that those techniques, right, so the modeling that we're going to be talking about today and trying to understand is what gives us the kind of scaling relations that were brought up. I mean, Romil brought them up when he talked about implementation in simulations. <coughs> so, um, so this is sort of the basic so obviously not all the physics ingredients, but the key sort of pared down key physics ingredients that are going to be relevant to understanding black holes um, and their growth. And I'll defer the discussion of the formation to later lectures. And right now we'll just, um, <coughs> I'll just state the sort of masses, relevant mass scales on which you can have black holes. And then obviously we'll focus on the ones that are relevant to galaxy formation. So I want to go briefly through primordial black holes. Really will not spend all that much time. And the reason for that you'll see, it's very, very unconstrained. So you know, it's not as interesting for us in terms of wanting to connect with observations, right? So that's the goal of a lot of the work that we are all doing. And then intermediate, intermediate mass black holes, they've been a very elusive population. It's actually very exciting, in my opinion, um, new result that came out last week. So 
that sort of uh, gives us a hint of a possible new way to detect them. Uh, and maybe they won't be so elusive in the future. And of course, then our friends, the supermassive black holes. So this is the population that uh, we all uh, know uh, are important, and they play a significant role um, in structure formation and galaxy formation in particular. And it's kind of interesting that, you know, even 25 years ago, uh, it was not acknowledged that, you know, it was not understood and therefore not acknowledged that they could even play a significant role. Because if you look at the Milky Way, the mass of the central black hole is 4 million solar masses. The mass of the galaxy is about 10 to the 12 solar masses. So the ratio, you know, they just don't seem gravitationally all that important. But we will see that, you know, gravity isn't everything. And it's uh, what you do with the gravity that uh, actually matters. And so supermassive black holes are going to be very effective systems, if you will, because we will be black boxing them at some level. They're very good systems to convert gravitational energy into other forms of radiation and heat and energy input into their immediate environment, perhaps the larger scale environment. And so by being a new source of heating for gas, in uh, galactic halos, uh, both um, at high and low redshift, they became very, very important modulators of cooling and therefore of star formation, right? So <coughs> then I'll start out with some basics of um, sort of accretion. And you'll see, and then you talk a little bit about modeling um, the accretion onto black holes, um, the structure of an accretion disk which basically they're universal disks, and I'll try to show you why they're inevitable, basically. Luckily for us, in a way, that's a, it's a geometric configuration where the um, general relativistic properties of the black hole, by and large, are not going to matter. They matter only to the extent that we're going to have guidance as to how far in any kind of accretion disk structure that we come up with, what is the inner edge? What's the inner boundary condition, right? How far? And so what is the kind of flow that we need to establish to fuel the black hole? Obviously, the key challenge is connecting the flows on very large scales to the flows on very small scales. And as I've been alluding, the parameters that are going to be important are obviously the black hole mass and the accretion rate, like how the mass supply rate. So let's see how you can relate them. What are the various uh, physical properties that are relevant to relate them? And then if I have time, so because there's three lectures, I mean, I'll just continue if I don't get to the end of it. Talk a little bit about super Eddington accretion. <coughs> um, I won't spend too much time on it, um, just give you a flavor for what it is. Partly because at this moment, there's only one object, credibly, where I think we've seen Super Eddington, SS433. And uh, it would be, it's a very nice fix. I would, of course, love to have it at early redshift um, so we can see what are the conditions that you need for Super Eddington accretion to operate. And so uh, because these are very pedagogical lectures, I just wanted to alert you to what my sources are. So many of these notes were actually developed in collaboration with Andrew King for a set of lectures that we gave actually together. And um, they are drawn from this book, Accretion Power in Astrophysics, uh, which I like very much, um, Frank King and Rain. It's an old book, but you know, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's a good book. Nothing much has changed in terms of the formalism. And then the other um, article that I have drawn a lot from is an annual reviews article from the 1980s uh, by Jim Pringle on accretion disk, where he actually did a lot of the solutions. So, you know, I've been toying with trying to give you guys a little exercise to play with tomorrow, which is to just do the accretion disk solutions for a steady state thin disk, just for yourself. You don't have to turn it in. But it's just that, you know, I'll show you all the scalings and the dependencies that are important. And there's just no easy way to explain why does something scale as 12 fifth to the power, for example. You just have to do it. So we'll see, we'll see how, I, how far I get. OK, so the major challenge. So you might say this is great, but you know, we saw what the simulations can do. And uh, Romil and others, and Romil and Lars, who's here, I mean, they have some amazing, and Roman, they have so many amazing simulations. You're like, why do we need to do this kind of hand wavy model? So it turns out that the scales are really, really daunting. So it's at the moment, we still do not have a simulation that can capture the general relativistic properties of the space-time around the geometry around a black hole, which will obviously impact the final flow, right? All the way out 
to the large scale cosmological flow. In fact, even for just the classical bit, going from the cosmological flows of structure formation for a large enough box so that it's a, you have a representative chunk of the universe, all the way down resolving to the Schwarzschild radius is not something we can do. So where we can get to is you know, 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6 times the Schwarzschild radius. And um, you know, that's as close as we're going to get with the simulation. So the analytic work, the analytic modeling, has to really help us bridge the gap in terms of scales. And so that's the advantage of doing this kind of work. So before I um, move on to start looking at the specific geometry of accretion that's going to be relevant for um, black hole growth and galaxy um, uh, formation, so let's get some uh, fun definitions out. So as you all probably know, um, the uh, black hole solution was actually predicted as a mathematical solution. It was an exact equation to Einstein's field equations. And it's a, it's, you know, and Einstein never imagined that there would be an exact solution. And it turns out Carl Schwarzschild came up, within, with, came up with it within months. And it's the only spherically symmetric non-rotating uh, um, the geometry around a spherically symmetric non-rotating mass. And it's an exterior solution, so you're sitting outside the mass distribution. And um, so it's, it's generally valid. It doesn't have to be a point mass. It can be a mass distribution. And so as long as you are exterior to that mass distribution, this is the right solution. And um, the characteristic metric that describes um, the region around this mass distribution uh, is the Schwarzschild metric. And so those of you who've done GR and tensors and so on would have seen this form, and there's a pointer, would have seen this form for the metric. And what is interesting is that this metric in the limit that the mass turns to, uh, goes to zero, so actually uh, reverts to flat space time. And um, when also when r goes to infinity, it reverts to flat spacetime. So far away from the mass, you're back to flat, uh, flat spacetime. And um, close enough um, to the mass, as the mass goes to zero, you recover um, flat spacetime. So these are the sort of two limits. And uh, just as, a, as an aside, you know, this was the exact form that was used to uh, calculate the deflection of light by, uh, by the sun using m equals one solar mass. Uh, in <coughs> and that was verified uh, in 1919 uh, experimentally. OK, so you can see from the form of this term that there are going to be two interesting further uh, special cases. One is when, so by the way, some of you might have seen this equation without the c squared explicitly with c set to 1. So just to remind you, I, I, some, I mean, I, in a lot of places, I put the c squared in explicitly because occasionally we'll be doing sort of dimensional arguments to get the dimensions right. So I'll keep track of my c's, uh, but not always. So, um, so you can see that this term, right, so it, it's uh, interesting because there's a limit in which uh, 1 minus 2 gm over rc squared uh, will go to zero, and so you get a singularity. That singularity is actually a coordinate singularity. That's the Schwarzschild radius. And then you have the essential singularity, the physical singularity, which is r equals zero, when everything blows up, right? And <coughs> so basically at r equals zero, all our descriptions essentially break down. And out of the coordinate singularity, we get this definition of the event horizon or the Schwarzschild radius, which is a radius in which you have a proportionality to the mass of the black hole. So you can see already that the mass of the black hole is really going to be one of our key modeling parameters, right? And you can see sort of it really comes from uh, the basic black hole solution. So I should just point out here as a, as a minor historical aside that for the longest time, no one thought that this mathematical solution would actually correspond to a real object, right? So it actually took the, uh, till about the 1960s, even though um, uh, people in stellar evolution, Chandra and others had shown that the end states of stars could give you that kind of compact object, 
a kind of compact mass distribution. So just to help you visualize, so this is that event horizon that you get r equals 2 G gm over c squared. And it turns out that uh, aside from that one scale, important scale for uh, a black hole, there's another one of interest for us because you know we are eventually interested in all the uh, scales that are relevant to any observational consequences, if possible, right? So it turns out that there is the photon radius, which is about three halves the Schwarzschild radius. And this is the place where photon orbits are actually stable, light orbits are stable. So for example, many of you might have heard of this um, upcoming project called the Event Horizon Telescope, where people are planning to using the entire Earth as a VLBI dish, uh, planning to image the event horizon of the black hole in the center of the Milky Way and M87. So you know, this is the, the phenomenon, the fact that light orbits are going to be stuck here forever, so those are stable orbits, and so they will cast a shadow of some sort, and that's what is going to be measured for the first time. And um, as for evidence for the event horizon itself, the Schwarzschild um, radius, we will see later that we have indirect evidence because of how things scale with the Schwarzschild radius. We've not really seen anything quite falling in right there, right at that radius. Okay. Okay. <coughs> so what about um, real black holes? Let's jump to reality immediately, as I said, that now we know that we have, um, we have detected phenomena that are consistent with, as we'll see, energetically to suggest the presence of black holes over a range of mass scales. So the first is stellar mass black holes. And we have uh, evidence for stellar mass black holes from many, many different lines. One is the end, of course, you know, the end state of stars the fate of stars more massive than eight to 10 times the mass of the sun. We know, so from the various outcomes for stellar uh, evolution, neutron stars, white dwarfs, and black holes, uh, the fact that we see neutron stars and white dwarfs, we know that this channel also works. And we also know one of the earliest black hole candidates was Cygnus X1, and of course, the spectacular discovery of <coughs> binary <coughs> gravitational waves from the mergers of binaries by the LIGO collaboration has uh, provided us evidence for black holes in this particular mass range between 1 to 50 solar masses, right? So then <coughs> we, of course, have huge amount of evidence mounting um, all the time, both for the presence of quiescent black holes that are not accreting and black holes that are actively accreting that are supermassive, so basically anything in the sort of the mass range of about 10 to the 6 and above is what we call supermassive black holes. In fact, if we now even have some evidence for dormant black holes that, uh, as well as some very early quasars that are probably above 10 to the 9 solar masses um, as well. And of course, the, uh, the best evidence, in my opinion, of course, for quays and black holes comes from Milky Way, mapping the orbits of stars in the center of the Milky Way, and the water maser in NGC 4258. So <coughs> then there is a population of intermediate mass black holes that kind of should be there, because if the idea, and m many of our ideas are that you start with lower mass black holes, and over cosmic time, you build up mass, and you build more massive black holes, rather the same framework that we have for galaxies. Um, then there should be this intermediate population of black holes from about 1,000 solar masses to 10 to the 6 solar masses. So this population has been very elusive in terms of conclusive evidence. So they have, but there are many, many candidates. There's ultra-luminous X-ray sources, the luminosity of which, as we'll see, suggests that they should be powered by accretion onto intermediate mass black holes. So let me spend just a couple of minutes on primordial black holes, only because they're kind of cool, although they are astrophysically, in my opinion, at the moment, not only not very well constrained, but potentially not as interesting. How, astrophysically, 
because I think that these, it's quite unlikely in my opinion that these are actually the seeds for uh, the black holes that seed the supermassive black holes early on in the universe. But as I said, this is my bias because I have a pet theory. Uh, but look, I'm giving you know equal opportunity time, right? To uh, I am talking about them. Uh, most astrophysicists really don't take them seriously at all. Okay, so they're sort of an interesting population, and the idea here is that you have perturbations very, very early on, just post-inflation, um, and these density perturbations would collapse, and you know these black areas are supposed to visually show you the regions that have collapsed and give you primordial black holes. And then over time, you basically grow them, and then when you bring them into the matter-dominated era, remember this is all radiation-dominated era, and you bring them into the matter-dominated era, then they could start accreting, depending on which environment they find themselves in, uh, and so on. So then they would just join what would be our senses of seed black holes, right? So, but they would be seeded very, very early on. So one of the problems with, um, with sort of models of primordial black holes is the fact that there's, of course, a lot of uncertainty about you know, when they could form. And there's a whole range of masses. So primordial black holes can form over a range of masses depending on when they actually form. So if they form 10 to the minus 43 seconds after the Big Bang, then uh, they would be really, really tiny, 10 to the minus 5 grams or so. If they form later on, 10 to the minus 23, they would be about 10 to the 15, and this is an interesting mass. Um, 10 to the 15 grams is kind of interesting because it's, uh, that's the <coughs> uh, 10 to the minus 5, by the way, is the Planck mass. And 10 to the 15 is interesting because that is the mass of a primordial black hole that could have evaporated by now, and so that it wouldn't be there. So the evaporation time scale, as you all know, um, is, um, is very, very long for black holes like uh, the one in the center of the Milky Way or any sort of astrophysical black holes. But for this mass, 10 to the 15 grams, um, it turns out that this population could actually have evaporated uh, away. And uh, 10 to the 5 solar masses, if they formed, I'd say, one second. So this is, so you can see there's a huge range of possibilities offered for the mass spectrum, initial mass spectrum for primordial black holes. And the, as I said, the idea is very, very early on, you have a density perturbation that is the size of the horizon at that time, very, very early on. And it actually gets over dense and it collapses, and that's how um, you get the, uh, the primordial black hole. And so you need very large inhomogeneities. So you need so you know the rare regions that have very large inhomogeneities to start with, because remember you've got to kickstart the stuff very very early, so extremely rare. So you don't expect a huge population of them to be produced, even though there's a lot of uncertainty in their mass. Okay, so um, the question is, um, these would form in the um, radiation-dominated era, which means. Um, <coughs> So this basically tells you the mass and uh, the time of formation versus the, the scaling um, and the evaporation time scale scaling. Okay. And so if you started out, so let's look at, uh, at these mass ranges and try to understand you know, um, what are the consequences. So uh, obviously if you had primordial black holes that had masses less than 10 to the 15 grams, they should have evaporated by today. But Hawking has shown, and we now understand, that when they evaporate, right, they would produce gamma rays. They produce like 100 MeV type gamma rays during those early epochs. And um, that's what we should, they would, you know, that's the prediction for today, what we would see. So, but then we can use the constraint from the observed gamma ray background to set a limit on how many primordial black holes we have evaporated away. Okay, and it turns out that the current background limits tell you that it has to be less than 10 to the minus eight times the critical density of matter in this mass range, okay? I'm just trying to show you where we have constraints, okay? So these are the only kinds of constraints that you know, are reasonable constraints that we have. So um, if, you, if you know, um, 
We don't quite have a blackboard, but I think we do, right? Quickly. Yeah, I, that's enough, actually. I can just pull it a little bit, Rachel. Okay. That's enough. And there is chalk, right? Yeah. Ah, yeah. Colors. Yeah, so um, in the radiation-dominated era, you know that the scale factor goes as uh, t to the 1 half, and you know that the density goes as a to the minus 4. So that immediately gives you rho going as t squared. And from the fact that the um, formation time and the mass of the black holes are linearly related, rho will therefore 1 over will go as. So that's where you're getting the 1 over m squared. OK, so this is making them in the radiation-dominated era, gives you that. And just to remind you, this is sort of what's happening with the density of the universe over time. So when you're in the radiation-dominated era, so that's the red curve. And so that's the um, density in radiation that's falling off. It's 1 over a to the fourth. Then, um, uh, and in red, you have <coughs> the matter domination. And then there's a period where you have radiation matter equality. And then matter takes over. And of course, at extremely late times, if dark energy is a cosmological constant, then of course it's constant throughout, and then it starts to pick up. So you can see at very late times, we are moving into the dark energy dominated uh, universe. So um, you can actually compute. Um, <clears throat> and so the reason this was very, very interesting is partly there aren't too many constraints. So the question was, OK, what if we can make all the matter density um, including dark matter, obviously, which is the dominant component, out of primordial black holes, right? So this is sort of a tantalizing. And the reason this is tantalizing is that, you know, we know the inventory of the universe at the moment. We know that this is the only piece that we can really account for very well, which is the baryonic piece, which is less than 5%. And then this is dark matter, which is about 23% or so of the entire budget. And then, of course, there's dark energy. And we've been, you know, looking for 30 years, and there's no evidence for WIMPs, right? So this was a very interesting suggestion that was made way back when, in 1996. And it has found sort of resurgence with the work of Simeon Bird and Mark Komiankowski. They redid this calculation in light of the fact that the LIGO collaboration was detecting black holes that appear to be you know, in the 30-ish um, you know, uh, solar masses. So, but this was the sort of original paper that lays out how um, these density inhomogeneities that I just showed you, how they could collapse during the inflationary epoch and actually give you, uh, so they calculated the first sort of spectrum that you would get for primordial black holes. And then later on in 2015, um, uh, there was work, uh, Garcia Bellido, kind of moved along that work and then said, OK, let me then look and make this connection with dark matter and see if I can explain all of dark matter with these primordial black holes. So it turns out that <coughs> before I get to um, showing you where the, where the current limits are, why do we care? OK, so we care because the physics, so the physics on scales of the inflation, as you know, the surface of last scattering is the last place from which we get direct data right, in the universe. So we can't really go further back beyond this. So this is tantalizing. If you could actually put any constraints on primordial black holes, then it's pushing us and giving us some new observational constraints on a class of black holes on a mass scale that, and an epoch of the universe that we really cannot probe any other way. And of course, as I said, the most tantalizing prop, you know, proposition is what if all the dark matter was made of these primordial black holes? Because we've not found black holes yet. I actually don't think this is the solution, as I told you my prejudice. But anyway, um, and we also have constraints from other experiments like uh, Macho, the, um, the lensing, microlensing experiments, in which they looked to try and constrain the granularity of our halo, of the halo of the Milky Way 
looking towards the LMC, looking towards the bulge, looking for microlensing events by sort of compact objects. So if you're a population of flitting PBHs, then they should be giving you microlensing events. So the question is, we've detected the events. Let's interpret them in the light of PBHs. And then what do we get, right? And of course, then, you know, whether they could be potential seeds. So very, very quickly to show you um, where we are at. So f uh, with Macho, they found 17 events. So these are microlensing events, basically um, a, 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 a magnification due to the passage of a star, um, a compact object passing in front of a star. So you have a huge spike. And so they uh, measured those, and they had about 17 events. These are events that were seven sigma or above. And they found that they were consistent with compact objects that were about a half solar mass or so that constituted about only 20% of our halo. So they could not account for all the dark matter that should be in the Milky Way galactic halo with compact objects in that mass range. So the goal of that project was to look at various ranges. And so we're just going to map and see what if these guys were actually black holes. right? And so and these were visited by f various other you know, constraints from EROS. They're all other microlensing experiments. But then it turns out that you know, many of these events, this, this claim got diluted because a lot of the events could actually be explained by um, clumping in the halo itself or you know, self-lensing uh, by stars. And so um, we don't have any tri uh, tight constraints on I mean, we can kind of rule out a population of primordial black holes, basically, as the source for microlensing. But then there are some other interesting astrophysical signatures if this population did exist and it persisted. And the reason I'm saying all of this is, right, I mean, I don't know, eventually there may be an observation and we may have to start including them in our models as possibilities, right? So just keeping all possibilities open. So if there was a population of wandering uh, primordial black holes, even if they didn't constitute all of dark matter, but they were still there, then we would see them because they would disturb the dynamics of stellar binaries. They could disrupt them as a third body that comes in. They're floating around. They could cause disk heating if they punch through disks. right? And they could alter the stability of streams because they're sort of floating around. Right? And they could heat stars. I mean, so there are a lot of effects that they could. So this is a set of astrophysical constraints. This is not the latest one. There's a very nice paper by Yassin. Um, Hamoud um, at NYU, and you should look that one up. But I picked this one only because it actually, you know, there are some constraints you can get from uh, the LIGO binaries, and I don't have time to go into that, so I wanted to show you a version that didn't have them. So there's some, some limits here. So essentially, there are small regions of space allowed. So this is a plot of compact mass, um, macho or PBH and the fraction of dark matter they could potentially uh, constitute. So there's some very, very small windows that are really left. But just I want you to keep an eye on this axis. They really cannot quite account. They can account at the moment conservatively for a fraction of the dark matter content. Okay, So okay, we're done with primordial black holes now. <laughs> OK, let's move on. Um, so uh, for stellar mass black holes, as you all probably know, we have some of the most impressive constraints on their masses. The most impressive ones have, of course, come from the new window of um, detecting their collisions and the gravitational waves that ensue from, the, from their collisions by the LIGO collaboration. And this is sort of the current status of reported LIGO events and the masses of black holes. So you have the masses here. And notice these are sort of the, uh, the blue events are all the LIGO events. The X-ray binary black holes that were detected are in purple here. And then these are sort of the known neutron stars. So this is sort of a compact object zoo that we now know, right? And so this is also, this is, um, um, you know, this is obviously the uh, gravitational wave people hijacking all the other electromagnetic wavelengths as well. And so here I just put the constraints from um, uh, X-ray binaries and the, um, 
the masses that were inferred. This is prior to the LIGO. So at, at any rate, we now know that there's a population of stellar binaries out there, and we know how to make them, and we know the sort of uh, dynamically how, to, how they grow, how they accrete matter from a companion, and so on and so forth. So there are signatures both in the X-ray, and there are signatures from the gravitational wave coalescence. So intermediate mass black holes, so this is the elusive range of about a thousand, few thousand to about 10 to the five solar mass. So there has been very scant, reliable evidence for the existence of intermediate mass black holes. And um, we've often always wondered whether there was either something peculiar about black hole growth that makes this stage very short, for example, so which is why we've never sort of found them, or maybe um, there's something more fundamentally wrong in our picture of the initial mass function of black holes, right? So maybe there's a gap. I don't think there's a gap, but maybe, right? So, so there's a new paper this, uh, this past week, <coughs> which I thought was very, very exciting, and I couldn't resist mentioning it. And that is a new, uh, a new pathway to detect intermediate mass black holes. And that is the, uh, by, by finding off-center tidal disruption events. So this is a case where you have two galaxies, and they found a tidal disruption event. And they know it's a tidal disruption event because it had all the characteristics in terms of the light curve that's predicted. So tidal disruption, the disruption of a star by a black hole, and you get a flare. And that flare should peak in the x-ray first with a t to the minus 5 thirds uh, power. And then you should see it decay in the optical, and so on and so forth. So all of that was detected for the source. So this actually turns out this flare was sitting in 2005 in the Chandra data, which I think is so cool. So I went back, and they found. And so this is a candidate. And from the luminosity of the flare, you can infer what the black hole mass is. And I'll, we're just going, that's where we're going next. Like, how do you infer that, right? And so they inferred that this guy is an intermediate mass black hole. And what's really been challenging to find intermediate mass black holes has been the fact that you know, if they were the central black holes, right, you um, have the usual issues with, uh, unless you know, they're just below the X-ray detection limits, and they sort of really skirt at the limit in terms of being detectable in the X-ray. And dynamically, they are in very, very difficult places to dynamically infer their presence. So finding, we expect now all the models that we've been doing and the simulations suggest that they should be a lot of wandering black holes in the halos of galaxies. And therefore, if tidal disruption by these wanderers would be a new method to detect um, intermediate mass black holes, then I think we're onto something. So you know, that part of the initial mass function of black holes should get filled up fairly soon. OK, so now let's move on to, um, to accretion physics, so sort of the basics of accretion physics. And here, the goal is to try and understand how gas makes its way to the black hole, and what are the physical processes that are associated with the capture of that gas particle, how much energy is released, and what part of the electromagnetic spectrum that energy comes out in. So but that's what we need for the modeling, right? And what we need to know is what, how does this energy scale with some fundamental properties of the black hole. So basically, we are going to look at a situation where you have a compact object, and you have gas falling in. And essentially, gravitational energy of the infalling gas gets converted. Some portion of it gets converted into electromagnetic radiation. Right? So, and this is what we want to set up. So if the accretor, the compact object, has a mass m, and has a radius r, then the gravitational energy released per unit mass is just gm over r. And this yield, as you can see, scales with the compactness of the object with m over r, right? So the more compact an object, the more energy you can get out of it. Um, and therefore, a black hole, which is more compact than a neutron star, for example, can give you much more energy. We'll just plug in numbers in a little bit, right? And so the smaller the accretion radius, so the more compact the black hole case, you get a lot of energy. And for accretion onto a neutron star, just put in the numbers. So for a one solar mass neutron star with a radius of about 10 kilometers, you get about 10 to the 20 ergs per gram. Okay? 
So let's just plug in, before we do that, let's see the one other process where we know you get a lot of energy out is nuclear fusion. So let's just look at the yield in fusion. You get something like 10 to the 18 ergs per gram. So notice already, even for a neutron star, the energy that you get out of accretion is two orders of magnitude more per gram uh, than a nuclear fusion. Now, of course, uh, you hit the lottery with the black hole because of the compactness. So the Schwarzschild radius, if you plug in the 2GM over C squared, you'll find that essentially you can get a huge amount of energy. You get C squared over 2. The question is, how much of this energy can you actually tap? How much actually makes it out as electromagnetic radiation that is available for you for feedback to heat the gas, whatever, um, is, um, is, where, uh, is what we're going to do next. So basically, up to 10% of, so this is, um, this is the rest mass energy, up to 10% of the rest mass energy is going to be available to be tapped into EM radiation, which means it's going to be available to alter the energetics of galactic nuclei. Okay, so we're gonna, we have a source that basically is much more potent than a bomb that can go off in the center of nuclei. Okay. And this is the most efficient way that we know and so if we write out the luminosity of accretion, then that is proportional to this gm over r times m dot, which is the mass feeding rate, the accretion rate. And essentially, we can write, out, write it out as eta times. And this is the efficiency of conversion of that gravitational energy that we saw, the portion of it that you can tap electromagnetically. And that is typically of the order of 10%. So eta c square m dot is the accretion luminosity. So you can see that any kind of modeling that we may now want to do for how important a black hole is, the key thing is m dot, which is the feeding rate. Okay? And uh, so some quick numbers. So if you take quasars, they're about 10 to the 46 ergs per second. So that requires a feeding rate of about a solar mass per year. And if you look at x-ray binaries, the luminosities are about 10 to the 39. So much, much diminished compared to a quasar, and the feeding rate is about 10 to the minus 7 solar masses per year. Gamma ray bursts are kind of interesting because they're actually more energetic than quasars, but they remember they're sort of transient, they last for a short period of time. Their feeding rate is 0.1 solar masses per second. Okay? So um, this is just to give you a flavor for the kinds of energies th that we have. OK, but then uh, if we move along and think a little bit about the physics, you can see right away that if accretion produces radiation, you know radiation has pressure, you have radiation pressure. The question is that radiation pressure, what does it actually do? Does it actually choke out the flow? Does it stop accretion? Does it modulate the accretion? So to, do, to understand what the, the impact, the interaction of the radiation with uh, uh, radiation pressure with the infalling feeding, you find that there's kind of a, um, as a magic stable uh, state here. Okay? You, get a, you get a nice steady state. And that is when the radiation pressure um, actually equals the, um, the gravitational force. And remember, this is a plasma we are talking about, right? By the, oh yeah, okay, the next slide will tell you the temperature. Yeah, so this is a plasma. So the, the, um, the radiation pressure force is just the luminosity times Thomson scattering. Uh, this is stuff that's familiar to you. This is all in spherical symmetry. And the gravitational force, because this is a plasma, so you have electron-proton pairs, but remember the mass of the electron is tiny compared to that of the protons. So we can kind of drop that. And so the condition, the accretion will be inhibited, right? So the interaction, radiation pressure will become important when F rad is going to be comparable to F grav. And so that condition actually gives you a really nice um, um, luminosity, a steady state optimal luminosity, if you will, which is the Eddington luminosity. The nice thing about the Eddington luminosity is voila, we got our dream. There's only a dependence on the mass of the black hole. Okay? And, um, and this Eddington limit, so there are assumptions that have gone into getting this Eddington limit. And the key one is spherical symmetry. And so we'll come back and we'll break it and we'll see that we can actually break this limit. Okay, physically, you can find. So let's look, uh, and so this is the argument that is used to infer the masses of quasars whose luminosities 
you actually measure. So from the luminosity that's measured, you can see that bright quasars must be powered by accretion on to black holes that are in excess of 10 to the 8 solar masses. So this was an argument that was originally made by Donna Lindenbell. And similarly, if you look at the luminosities that we just saw for the X-ray binaries, like 10 to the 39 orgs or so, that then they have uh, masses powered by accretion onto masses, stellar mass uh, black holes. Okay, so the Eddington limit, therefore, limits, because we can now, we now know that the uh, Eddington rate is proportional to the mass of the black hole, and we know that the luminosity in general is proportional to eta uh, c square m dot. We can then find what m dot is as a function of accretion. So we can write this out, and this is wonderful because this is just basically you get an ODE in which m dot dm dt equals m, proportional to m. So that has an exponential solution. And this is one of the key equations that we're going to be using when we understand the growth of black holes over cosmic time, modulo the conditions around the centers of galactic nuclei, feeding rate, so on and so forth. So essentially, the solution tells you that the final mass of a black hole is an initial mass times this exponential growth factor, and there's a characteristic time scale that you pull out of it. So that's actually the mass doubling time scale. So it grows by one e fold. And so that characteristic time scale is called the Sol Peter time scale, and it's about 5 times 10 to the 7 years. And this is very interesting because now, for all our modeling purposes, we've got a bunch of good scaling relations, and we have our first characteristic time scale that has appeared for the accretion problem, and that's few times 10 to the 7 years. OK, so then the question is, this is great. So we are assembling the pieces that are going to be needed for our modeling. And as I said, the one final, and I'm doing the broad brush now. We're obviously going to delve into details in a minute. But the broad brush is the next thing we really want to do is to go from these scaling relations to understand how much of that energy you could actually tap, which means how is it coming out electromagnetically in the spectrum, right? So let's do a quick uh, scaling argument to see what happens. So. Um, and let's first assume the simple case where all the energy is basically coming out. It's thermalized, it's coming out. So this uh, region, this inner region of the accretion flow encasing the black hole basically behaves like a black body. So let's then find out what the characteristic black body temperature is. It's simply the luminosity over 4 pi r square to the 1 fourth. And you find that if you put in for accretion onto uh, neutron stars, like 10 to 38, 10 to the 39 ergs, you get, and a radius of 10 kilometers, you get a black body temperature of about 10 to the 7 Kelvin. But then, it may not all be thermal, right? It may be a non-thermal emission, in which case, um, we can just think about what, uh, which population is sitting there. So you know that you have a population right around, you have the plasma, and you say, OK, you basically, you uh, turn the energy directly into heat, into some kind of, you shock the medium. So you have a, a, the temperature, relevant temperature now is a shock temperature. And so then you can calculate that. And so uh, once again, for a neutron star uh, case, you find that it's about 10 to the 11 K. So the typical photon energies for the, uh, in the case of uh, any accreting object should be between these two limits, right? So the black body limit and the non-thermal limit. So it turns out that for the uh, neutron star case, they lie between 1 keV and 50 MeV. So basically, you expect uh, uh, that tells you the region, the energy region in which the emergent spectrum should come out. And so you expect accreting neutron stars to be either X-ray or gamma, uh, gamma ray sources. And similarly, stellar mass black holes, because remember, that's just an order of magnitude up and down. So, and it turns out that this, just this understanding that we have so far is a very good fit broadly to the properties of X-ray binaries that are seen. So, but you know, the, 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 which is great, but you know, we are interested in the supermassive black hole. So let's just plug in the supermassive black hole numbers. So let's say the mass of a supermassive black hole, you have accretion onto 10 to the 8 solar mass black hole, and the Schwarzschild radius is about 10 to the 13 centimeters. So in the black body limit, the temperature we're getting is about 10 to the 5K, and the um, a TS, in the case of a non-thermal emission, you get the same numbers basically as uh, 
the neutron star case. So basically, we expect supermassive black holes because this is a lower temperature. You are ex you're going to get some UV emission as well. So you're going to get some uh, UV, X-ray, and gamma ray emitters. And it turns out this is a pretty good, you know, uh, let's not worry about the details yet, but it's a pretty good, just in terms of the overall numbers, a good fit to the properties of observed quasars. OK, so when we want to, so now we have um, a sort of um, a basic understanding of how to tap the energy from accreting uh, sources, the time scales involved, at least one time scale, one relevant time scale. And now what we really need to understand is how do we provide this feeding rate? Okay, so this m dot is shown up as an important parameter. So obviously there's m, which is the mass of the black hole itself, and that means how do you form the black hole? What, do you, what is the seed mass? So that's a question that I will defer to later. We won't be talking about that today. And so today, now we'll focus a lot on the m dot. How do we get the m dot? And how do we relate? So first, we'll study what the m dot is in the inner region, sort of in the disky region. And then we'll figure out how to connect it to um, um, m dot, the larger scale m dot. So we, we need to arrange, we need to figure out how the gas actually flows in. Um, and so that's sort of the feeding problem. And as you can see, this problem has cascading scale. So even if we solve the feeding problem at one scale, we don't necessarily solve it all the way down. So we'll have to slowly solve it scale by scale, because very different physical processes will be needed to deliver the gas. And as we'll see, not just deliver the gas, but get rid of the angular momentum over various scales. Right. So um, and um, so this is, as I said, you can break it into the feeding problem or the seeding problem or the you know, initial seed problem, and we'll focus on. OK, so uh, once again, I mean, there's a reason why I'm making this sort of analogy with x-ray binaries. I mean, I'll, you know, up to a point, because it's just, I'm just showing you it's a scaling. Everything is scaling, basically, with the black hole mass and the accretion rate. Right? And the phenomenology actually mirrors, in a way. So the AGN are basically scaled up versions by and large. So for binaries, uh, the feeding is a solved problem because we know that you, know, you have a feeding star from which there's Roche lobe overflow and you're grabbing gas. So we know that setting, we know that works. Um, and for growth, we know stellar evolution. Basically, we have a pretty good idea of how um, uh, stars are not all solved, um, I think. Um, well, Eve will tell you more about the knowns and the unknowns in the physics of star formation. Uh, but essentially, we kind of know how to produce the various, um, the IMF. We know roughly what the IMF is for stars. So that problem is kind of solved for binaries. For AGN, um, it's very interesting. So on the large scale, we think that uh, we might need galaxy mergers. But there's a reason why I put a question mark, because it's not clear. Maybe you don't need to deliver gas in such a piston uh, with a galaxy merger. That's the outer. This is the outer scale feeding problem. Then the inner scale feeding problems, getting the gas all the way in, having a prescription to do so, down to the Schwarzschild radius is not a solved problem. Okay, so what we have solved, we've come close. So we've come close. So we now understand about 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6 Schwarzschild radius. We kind of know how to arrange the matter so that it could come down to that radius. Okay, and the intermediate stage from the galaxy merger on to this 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6 Schwarzschild radius, we know that stars. We can actually use the dynamics of stars to uh, bring. <coughs> Um, uh, bring gas and stars in so we can actually get matter down close to the hole. So we kind of bridge the gap. So we have this hand wavy solution. Maybe it's mergers that can give you a piston at large radius. Maybe it's just steady cosmic accretion of gas. Okay, so the question mark is because it's, it's actually likely both, but they're going to be important in different contexts, as we'll see in the modeling results. And so the final parsec problem, as it's known, 
you know, depending on how optimistic or how pessimistic you are, you would say it's kind of solved because you know it's inevitably, uh, once you bring the gas to 10 to the 5, 10 to the 3 to 10 to the 5 spatial radius, it really has nowhere else to go. So even if we don't know how it's going to go, it's going to go to the hole, right? So, um, but you know, there is a problem. Um, there's a problem um, in terms of the cascading scales and how to connect. So I'll spend just a couple of um, couple more slides on the X-ray binaries, and then because you know, I'm going to try always to jump and make the connection. So for example, if you look at a galaxy like the Milky Way, we have a central black hole that's 10 to the four, uh, four, 10 to the six, four times 10 to the six solar masses. But then it has, we have about 100 or so, few hundred actually, about 200-ish X-ray uh, point sources with luminosities from th 10 to the 38 to 10 to the 39 ergs per second. And so the, and the typical spectral, we are seeing the spectral signatures in the X-ray for these guys, uh, which is great. Though this is suggesting that um, basically their sort of the black body kind of approximation is not bad. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, and in some cases we've made even optical identifications of these X-ray sources, and, we, and those are the high mass X-ray binaries. But in many cases, the low mass X-ray binaries, we don't actually see the, uh, the companions, but we know what these beasts are, okay? And so this is just from a nearby galaxy from M101. It's just showing you the optical counterparts to the X-ray sources. Okay, so let's move on to um, um, the black hole case where we now need to understand the details of the flow. Okay, so let's look at a slightly simpler problem that was done by Bondi, Hoyle, and Littleton, which is, you know, angular momentum is the complicating factor. So for now, let's just say we have zero angular momentum gas, spherically symmetric. This is like the easiest possible thing we can think of, the most ideal situation. Uh, so you basically have a body, a compact object that's moving supersonically through uh, a constant density uh, gas medium, so let's not worry about self-gravity either. This is the simplest case, right? So basically, the gas in the vicinity will uh, uh, accrete because you, ha you have this wake, so you have this gas, you know, you have a, uh, a plume, and the gas will finally accrete. And you can compute in this ideal scenario what the accretion rate is, right? And this accretion rate so there's an accretion radius. This C is actually the accretion radius. So that's pi r square that you see times uh, v infinity, rho infinity, where v infinity and rho infinity are basically the, the values of the ambient medium, the properties. The, this is the density of the gas. Rho infinity is the density of the ambient medium. And v infinity is the, um, so it's a medium that is flowing. So you, you can think of it as a, star is a black hole, whatever, so this is the sort of accretion rate that you get. And so what you find in this kind of setting, the accretion rate is proportional to m squared, and this m squared comes from this r squared. So in the case of a compact object, remember r is proportional to m, so you're getting that second power there. Um, and OK, so just store that in your mind, basically, as one simple prescription to understand. So what is this accretion radius? So one second, one more thing I should mention. So the accretion radius is basically the radius within which, from within which all the gas is basically going to be accreted onto the compact object. Okay. That, uh, yeah, it's the relative, yeah. It's the relative velocity between that of the wind, if you will, and the object. I should have clarified that. I should have written it explicitly as VC and V wind, but anyway, yeah. That's the relative velocity. Okay, so now what we've seen is that basically if you have simple spherical symmetry and you have a compact object that is moving supersonically through a gas, the gas medium, medium of gas, you know that there's an accretion radius from within which all the matter can be accreted on. So let's now move to a slightly better formulation. Let's try and understand now what happens if you have this compact object and you have gas that is flowing right around it. So the initial orbit is a rosette, 
and it self, uh, self intersects. But whenever you have self intersection, you have energy dissipation, so you have some energy loss, but there's no angular momentum loss. So remember, now we are in the setting where we are trying to understand the flow with some angular momentum. We did the zero angular momentum case, we figured it out. Now let's do the real case of finite angular momentum. So basically, you all know that the lowest energy orbit with a fixed value of the angular momentum, it, that's a Kepler problem, right? That's a Kepler orbit, and it's a circle, right? So essentially, whatever this gas is doing, it will eventually circularize, because that's going to be the lowest energy um, uh, state with finite angular momentum. We know that, right? So the question is, you orbit, you circularize, and you still have your angular momentum intact. So essentially what's going to happen, depending on the amount of angular momentum that you have, you can think of the final configuration for a gas packet as kind of circles with different values, annuli with different values of the angular momentum. And that is a disk, basically, okay, right? So, um, so you end up with these nested Kepler orbits for different values of the angular momentum, right? Circles and concentric circles, right? And this kind of structure is basically the accretion disk. And in order to understand this structure a little, in a little finer way, obviously, okay, so this is, this is sounding like this is the configuration, and now it has to flow in. And to do that, basically, you have to lose the angular momentum, right? So, so the problem really becomes that you have an equilibrium configuration, which we can characterize, on top of it now. So we moved from the case with zero angular momentum, finite angular momentum, and we figured out how this will settle. But now, in order for the material to actually make it onto the compact to the black hole, you need to lose the angular momentum, which means we need to give this disk some other additional properties. And we'll see what we need to do. You can probably all see, and you, most of you have seen this probably before, that essentially what we're going to add in to this configuration that we've inferred, um, some mechanism that will then get rid of the angular momentum so that you can then, we'll see, have a net flow of mass to the center. So you can break these circular orbits by getting rid of some angular momentum, and finally, you can make the flow go towards the compact object. Okay, so that's the basic physics. So I think you know, a lot of people uh, ask you why, do you, why do you need a disk? And you see, well, basically, this is why you need the disk structure. And then on top of that, as I said, you know, I'm adding one bell and whistle at a time. So now we're going to then need some kind of viscosity in the disk that is going to help you dissipate the um, angular momentum, get rid of the angular momentum, give you some kind of mechanism. Um, and actually, it turns out the solution that we have is just as vague as what I'm saying. It's pretty vague, but you know, it's a scaling relation. So essentially, as I said, the final accretion requires you to lose angular momentum, and uh, and basically the, you know, and and the the scale down into the cascading scale in terms of the ratio of the radius of the outer orbits in this disky structure to the inner one is about greater than a factor of hundred. Okay. So basically, the, there's, you will need, you know that there will be energy loss due to dissipation, and it turns out that that's going to be actually faster than angular momentum. You really do have to get rid of angular momentum, right? So you might be able to get rid of the energy, but you'll be stuck with angular momentum, right? And, and so uh, at the outer edge, you can say that in the case of a binary, X-ray binary, Right, so here we have, now let's go back to our settings. We go back to the setting of the X-ray binary. Then we can see that in the case of the X-ray binary, because you have this companion, right? You can say, oh, there's some tides from the companion, and basically um, that you could start removing angular momentum from the outskirts because of tidal activity driven by the uh, 
So that's Frank, King, and Rain, uh, chapter five, um, uh, does develops all the equations. So what I'll first do is to give you, yeah. angular momentum not being lost when the initial, during the initial orbit of the material. I'm not sure I understand if this is just an idealized model where- Oh, it's an idealized model. Oh, okay. It's a totally idealized model okay. um, uh, to show you basically that every, if you draw annuli through a disk key structure, the property that you need to characterize every annulus is the mass in the surface mass density matrix and the angular momentum, okay. Okay. basically, right? Um, the radius, surface mass density, and the angular momentum. So um, basically, the accretion disk structure that we will be uh, that we obtain for accretion on uh, around a compact object is essentially a differentially rotating gas disk, which we can think or think of as having circular pieces, circular annuli that are patched together, and each circular annulus has um, a characteristic surface mass density, radial location, and characteristic angular momentum for that orbit. Yeah? And so we can map the surface density, which is basically mass per unit area of this disk, as the density times h, the disk scale height. And basically, their rotational angular velocity will increase towards the center and the angular momentum decreases towards the center. So basically, you have to get rid of angular, when you get rid of angular momentum, you will be moving radially inward, okay? So basically, you get that direction, that checks out, that's what we want to do. So then, of course, you know, the question is, what are the approximations that we make? So you make a very convenient approximation that you make is that the disk is thin, in which case, this disk scale height, h over r, is much, much less than one. And what that really translates into is that the sound speed over the Keplerian velocity, remember the Keplerian velocity around a compact object is just gm over r to the one half. So this ratio is actually much, much less than one. Okay? And here we are ignoring pressure forces. So remember, I am building this, the storyline I'm building for you is you know, one complication at a time to show you how we solve. Uh, and, 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 and this, basically the reason we like thin disks is because they can cool, okay? They can cool, they can dissipate, what is cooling? Basically, they can dissipate energy. They can dissipate angular momentum, we'll see how, but they can definitely dissipate energy. And so, um, as I've stressed, you know, it's inevitable that you're going to form this disk-like structure uh, accretion around a, a black hole. So, um, let's see, so the disk, you know, ideally, what do we want? We want, as we'll see, a disk to form nicely around a black hole, right out to the innermost stable circular orbit, right? That would be just awesome. If we could just resolve things down to there, then we're home in terms of connecting the accretion rate, the mass flow rate at the innermost stable. We'll just see, oh yeah, I haven't defined that yet, oops. Okay, so the innermost stable circular orbit, so that's the accretion rate that we want. Right? If we can solve that in the problem, I mean, if that we can relate that in our models, then we're kind of done. Okay, so um, basically we want this accretion disk structure to be quite compact because the problem we want to solve is the cascading small scale feeding problem, right? So that's what, you know, we really want this to be a compact disk. And um, so feeding, so if you look at the context of a supermassive black hole in a galactic nucleus, feeding is actually really hard, both in terms of the mass supply, and we will see getting rid of the angular momentum. So that's the next thing we're gonna do, right? And it may well be that, you know, it's the, the fact that we don't know quite how to uh, get rid of this angular momentum very effectively that, um, you know, the, the black hole doesn't really grow to be all that oomphy in the centers of uh, galaxies. Okay, so let's see, what did I want to... So basically, oh, this is just to show you that the angular momentum 
actually increases. So getting rid of the angular momentum becomes more and more of a serious issue as you get closer in. Really, really have to do that. Okay, so and the capture rate, the kind of accretion rate that we've been talking about is like an, uh, is sort of the, um, is, is the M dot is really what we want to get right. Okay, so let's just quickly talk about what you need to now arrange. So now we have the structure of an accretion disk, I have the best case scenario, simple one, which is a thin disk, right? And now I need to add a mechanism that's going to get rid of the angular momentum. So the mechanism that has been proposed was uh, by Shakura and Sunyaev had a really particularly nice model that we have all capitulated to. It's not a microphysical model. It's a scaling relation, but as I'm showing you, the scaling relations that we are all building up, right, they make sense, right? So uh, it seems quite natural and works extremely well and matches uh, the cases where we can do simulation. So it's a, it's a reasonably, um, there are other ways, other important ways to get rid of angular momentum as well, and that's magnetic fields. And, and the kinds of instabilities that magnetic fields induce. So I really won't be spending too much time on that, but I will s give you a set of references to read uh, at after the next lecture. I'll give you a brief insight into how that works. So basically, we need some kind of viscosity. So you need a dissipative uh, process. And essentially, what you need, remember, we've settled all these things into annuli. So if we can come up with some kind of shearing between neighboring annuli, then that might be a way to dissipate angular momentum. Right? So that's really what they did. Basically, you need a dissipative process that transports angular momentum uh, outwards sort of against the gradient. The gradient is inward, so you need a process that pushes angular momentum outward. So as I said, the actual microphysics is unknown. Uh, I think the best guess is that it might be magnetic. So essentially what you want is a length scale lambda and a speed v that describes uh, sort of random motions around the mean when we want to look at the annuli. So now I'm, gonna mo so now I'm telescoping in, looking at the um, annuli, and I need to understand the random motions. But remember, out of these random motions, I have to construct a model where I can cohesively get rid of angular momentum and so that the dissipation is in a direction that is counter to the gradient, right? The, the gradient of angular momentum. Uh, so that I'm swiftly moving angular momentum from inside out. So we have a sort of, um, we, can, we can think it's some kind of molecular viscosity, and you can then identify this length scale as basically the mean free path of these random motions, and B is just the thermal speed of molecules, and sort of the sound speed. And so, you know, any other process you can think of, non thermal, whatever, basically has larger mean free paths. Uh, and will you know like turbulence and so on. So for our simple model, let's just stick with this. So basically, this we we are going to make up a viscosity. Uh, the viscosity is basically going to be an unbalanced torque, right? We'll just see it in a minute. So it's a viscosity that will uh, transport uh, momentum, of course, and angular momentum with it. And then voila, if we can fix this, then gas will move right in. Okay. And so this is uh, this is the kind of schematic for it. So we look at two neighboring layers of this disk at radius r minus lambda and r plus lambda from the compact object is here, where I'm, and this is the disk that's assembled. Right, so the torque of the inner ring on the outer one um, is given by two pi nu, sigma r cubed, d omega dr, and remember this nu, this viscosity, is just lambda times v. And this lambda was the mean free path, and v was the mean thermal motion. And so this, we'll do this in a little more detail. The derivation, I'm just kind of pulling this out to show you that we can do it. And then we'll delve a little bit more into how you get this. Um, there's some cute, uh, cute uh, it's a cute derivation. So then you can see the dissipation, right? So you have dissipation, and so you can calculate what the dissipation is. Uh, per unit face uh, area of the disk for a steady thin disk. And what you find, I'm just giving you this formula to, to home in on the fact that the dependencies, we like all the dependencies that are showing up, right? So we have a nice m dot that shows up, mass of the compact object, 
and of course, the inner, how you truncate, what is the inner part of that accretion disk, right? How do you truncate that disk? Where does it actually stop? Ideally, of course, we would like it to stop pretty close to the black hole, pretty close to few times Schwarzschild, but let's see, okay? So, um, so let's delve slightly deeper into how to set up so that you can understand how you get that equation for the torque. So essentially, you have a disk. Let's say it's confined to the orbital plane, and it has uh, this disk scale thickness. is Actually, it's h over 2, h over 2, so the total thickness is h. And so the surface mass density, by definition, is just the 3D density integrated uh, along the z. So you can write it as 2h times the mean density. So we can move to polar coordinates, which is just easier for this setup. And so then we can write out first that v phi, the velocity component in the phi direction, is the same as the Keplerian, and that's gm over r. So and these two assumptions, so the assumption we've made here that you are confined to the orbital plane um, and that um, v phi is vk, and they are both required for the consistency that you, know, you ignore. Basically, we've been ignoring pressure right here so far. And um, so um, using viscosity, basically, you need this torque uh, between the neighboring annuli, as we just saw. And, um, and you know that this, this, for a rigid rotator, where you cannot actually slice it up as annuli, right? It's like a solid body rotation. Omega prime should be 0. So, so this is the setup for the torque. And the net torque is the difference in the torque between the two annuli, right? So that's really what we're looking at. So we want to look at the torque G at R plus delta R minus G of R. And uh, why? Because this torque does work. It does the work for us. It, the dissipation and the movement of angular momentum right, is achieved by the work. And the work done is done at this rate. And the interesting thing is that one of the terms is the transport of, not surprisingly, which is what we wanted, the transport of rotational energy. And um, that depends on the boundary conditions. And this, uh, the other term that you have, so you have two terms. One is the, um, the term that is a transport of rotational energy, and the other one that is dissipation. Right? So you have both these processes. And uh, you, if you look at the dissipation itself, you see that it's positive and, um, and again, vanishes for rigid rotation. And so you can write out what omega is, and you can write out the dissipation term once again in terms of quantities that we really love. And the only place our particular prescription for how this is done that sneaks in is in terms of this new, this coefficient of viscosity. And it's directly proportional to nu sigma and gm over r cube. OK. So now we can write out, basically, you can write out uh, mass conservation uh, to actually solve, to solve for the configuration, right? We, we can write out mass conservation. And basically, mass conservation gives you this equation. And we can write out the equivalent one for angular momentum conservation. But we need to take the viscous torque into account now, right? I mean, angular momentum is conserved only because you know, the angular momentum that's in the system plus the stuff that's removed by the torque. So that now appears on the right-hand side. And um, we can make a one more simplification. And finally, and the simplification is that uh, we can combine the equations to get rid of the a radial component of the velocity, and we can write out the equation explicitly as d sigma dt. This is the time variation of the surface mass density of the disk, right? So, and this is the diffusion equation for the surface density. Basically, this tells you from the diffusion PDEs that you've seen before that basically in this case, the quantity that um, is changing is that the mass diffuses in and angular momentum diffuses out. And the time scale, the relevant time scale for this is the viscous time scale that's r squared over nu. Okay? So notice everywhere here that the particular prescription of, for nu enters only via this factor nu. 
which is lambda times v, right? Okay. So there are more, I mean, much of the derivation, it's done slightly differently, but pretty much the same steps. You know, I've kind of tried to build one complication at a time. They kind of give you the full equations. Uh, so then if we look at that um, equation and now solve for the steady state, right? So what is the steady state configuration? How can I keep on delivering matter to the compact object? What are the conditions? Is there a specific form for sigma that I need, et cetera, et cetera, what's, uh, what we're going to investigate now? So if we set ddt equals 0 in the d sigma dt uh, equation that we just wrote, the diffusion equation, then we actually get that r sigma nu uh, vr is a constant. And this is related to the accretion disk, the accretion rate through the disk, which is actually steady. And then I can write out uh, an, the angular momentum explicitly uh, in terms of the um, dissipation, the viscous torque via the viscous torques G of R, and some constant C, which is going to be an integration constant when we solve that equation that shows up. And what we find that um, uh, what this tells you is there's a zero torque boundary condition. So basically, to get a steady state, you need to set up a system and find yourself a sensible R star close enough to the hole as possible, where basically you say the torque, the disk is truncated. So you have a zero torque boundary condition. Okay? And so in that uh, event, you can actually calculate analytically what C is, what G is. And then we can write it out, and we can plug things back in to what our surface dissipation rate, D of R, looks like. And once again, in order to implement this process, to get this process going, um, either in our models or in simulations, we need m dot, mass of the compact object, radius is a function of radius, um, and some characteristic scale R star, which is as close as we can get to the central object. Now, so let's remember, ultimately, we, where we are really going is we want to set this whole thing up, and we want to see how the energy comes out so that we can that tap into that energy for star formation um, um, or scuppering star formation. So if the disk is optically thick, then once again, you know, black body. So then the dissipation term can be related to sigma Tv to the fourth, and we can calculate an effective temperature. What's nice about it is the effective temperature now is proportional to the accretion rate. So we get a lot of these fundamental quantities related to each other, a lot of the physics. It's just really beautiful and simple. And voila, Tb is independent of the viscosity. That's another reason why we've all been a little lazy and said, oh, yeah, Shakura Sunyev is fine. Because actually, it turns out that, you know, there are obviously, there are many processes and details that are very, very relevant to what the viscosity is. But large scale, the sort of observable connection to the observable, which is the emitted spectrum, and therefore sort of the assumption of black body, that temperature is actually independent of viscosity. OK, so one of the conditions for the thin disk, remember, was that the disk scale length h is much, much less than the radial extent of the disk, right? So it's a thin disk. So then um, the disk will be almost in hydrostatic equilibrium in the z direction. So then we can write out the equation for hydrostatic equilibrium, 1 over rho dp dz, the z direction. And we can see, we can simplify. And we can see what this term looks like. And what we, I mean, the reason we want to do that is we want to see, we want to understand a little bit more what the constraints on H are, the H, H R as an A R E, <laughs> not R. Um, and so we know that for an equation of state where, you know, you have uh, the pressure is proportional to the density times the uh, sp sound speed square, 
uh, we can then write out that dpdz can be approximated as pressure over h. Uh, that is making the approximation that the along the you know the in, we are integrating over z, and that is just basically h. And you find that h is proportional to cs over the Keplerian velocity times r. So for a thin disk, we require that the local Keplerian velocity, remember this thing is a function of r, right? So um, it should be highly supersonic. Okay. And why do we want that? We want that because remember the sound speed is proportional to t to the uh, half. And this means we basically, we want you know, the energy that's dissipated, right? We want it, we want to tap it for cooling so the disk can actually cool. So if this holds, right, then we can show that V phi, the azimuthal velocity, is also close to Kepler. So you'll see why a lot of theorists, I mean, so today's lecture was basically to show you why theorists are in love with thin accretion disks. Because we can do all of this, right? And we can kind of understand. I mean, then there's a minor detail of whether this corresponds to accretion in the universe, for real, right? Now, it it kind of does. Special in, in, in circumstances that are of interest. It's not valid for the Milky Way or anything nearby, by the way. This is all high Z stuff that we think could be uh, described by a thin disk. Um, OK, so I'll, I'll wrap up today with just a couple of a discussion of a couple of time scales that we've now figured out are kind of relevant for the accretion onto a black hole problem. So first, you know that the dynamical time scale is just simply R over VK. And that's the uh, Keplerian velocity. Then you have the viscous time scale, which is R squared over nu, that coefficient of viscosity. And then because you can cool, we just saw that you can cool with the term dr, we can actually calculate what the thermal time scale is. And so typically, for the approximations that we have made for a thin disk, steady thin disk, the dynamical time scale is less than the thermal time scale is less than the viscous time scale. So, and the reason this is important, if there are any perturbations to the disk that we add in, then whether that perturbation will have impact or not depends on whether it's shorter than the, t uh, the viscous time scale, longer than the viscous time scale, uh, and whether it is shorter than a dynamical time scale or longer than a dynamical time scale. So any perturbation, so you have a new, you have, you have a set of nested time scales, any perturbation that you want to do to the disk, you have to compare that to these um, relevant time scales. So I'll just wrap up. So you must have all wondered, okay, this is great, she's talking about this, but what about self-gravity? Am I missing something? So it uh, turns out that the size of the, um, the AGN disk is actually set by self-gravity. So if you look at the vertical component of gravity from the central mass, this is h, remember, so this is our h. It's gmh over r cubed. And the self-gravity of the disk is just g rho h cubed, so that's the mass in the disk over h squared, so that's g rho h. So obviously self-gravity will take over when rho is m over approximately m over r cubed. Uh, Self-gravity becomes important. So basically, the disk mass, we can write out the disk mass as r squared times h rho, and we can rewrite that as h over r times m. So basically, outside, outside this region, basically the disk will break up into stars. So, there, so in this whole scheme, we now have a way to get an outer edge, if we say self-gravity starts to become important, then we can no longer have this nice, steady, annular description for the flow. Beyond that, basically, the disk is um, uh, unstable and will break up uh, into stars. Right. So now, the final leap that we have to make, so we have some idea of what we could use to define as an outer edge for our computations, for our models. And we know what we aspire to for the inner edge. The question is, can we actually make that connection? 
And to make that connection, I just realized that I had forgotten to remind you about, uh, I forgot to give you the definition of uh, the innermost stable circular orbit. So let's first look classically at uh, two bodies, a two body problem, two bodies moving around each other. The energy equation for is a Newtonian point mass around a body M. We can write it out as the kinetic potential, that's the total energy. So now we move into a, a case where you have circular motion, right? so you have angular momentum. So you have specific angular momentum. Then you know that the potential has a piece that is L squared or J squared. You must have all seen this over 2R squared. Right? So this is the effective potential for a particle with a fixed angular momentum. And you can see why I'm doing this. A fixed angular momentum in a circular motion around another mass m. And you can actually calculate what are the stable um, solutions. So if the angular momentum equals 0, the particle will fall into the origin, which is you get accreted in this case. If it's non-zero, then the particle can escape. It can escape to infinity if the energy is greater than 0, but it stays bound if the energy is less than 0. This is a problem you've all seen, the classical problem. So there's going to be one little leap that comes next. So the circular orbit, as you all know, requires r dot equal to 0 so that the uh, potential energy equals total energy is constant, and dvdr is 0. So basically, you get circular orbits that are possible at the minimum of the effective potential. So when you do this for a black hole, I'm not going to show you the equations, but you get an additional term in um, the effective potential. You get a GR term that has to do with the gravitational mass of the body. So you get an additional piece where you get L squared over R cube. You get a piece there. Okay? And what that does, it sort of alters, um, alters what we get. And what, what it really alters is that you get uh, uh, an innermost stable circular orbit. So you get a steady, you get a steady point, which is the, is, uh, the ISCO. And this ISCO depends on, as I said, that um, you get an ISCO because you have an additional term in the effective uh, potential that comes from GR. And the ISCO actually depends on the spin angular momentum of the black hole. Okay? So you get this additional scale now, physical scale, where you have this innermost uh, stable orbit. I think I should stop now. OK, I'll continue this next time. So um, yeah. OK, thanks, everyone. Yeah. Yes, please. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I wanted to ask if these accretion disks around the black holes are they uh, are they clumpy? And yes. Does yes. That change uh, the <laughs> yeah, it changes. Yeah, it changes things. Yes. So um, they are clumpy. They are not as smooth as the ideal kind of disk that I've talked about, and. Um, we um, so you know we still manage to model them within the same framework by saying that essentially there's some clumping factor. So you can you can think of the gas being packed in a particular way in terms of clumps and a covering factor. Um, actually, as it turns out, the one other thing that I have not yet told you is, you know, eventually even if the thin disk is an approximation of a range. Eventually, in the innermost regions, you don't actually expect it to be a thin disk. You expect it to be lots of blobs, much more spherically symmetric <coughs> fat thing in the center, right at the center. And even for the, thin, the region where the thin disk is valid, you expect thin disk to be somewhat clumpy. And we think that we can continue to, in the sort of analytic, we can continue to model them with just some clumping factor for the gas that's distributed in a ring. Good. Yep. Uh, there's a question here. Oh, no. Just following up on that. So the clumping factor, does that go into the viscosity then? Or like where does it could. Go it could. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So it could be used to actually give a more physical meaning to the viscosity. More the guy. 
You're not supposed to ask questions. <laughs> Just kidding. Yeah. Driving. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> Impl uh, impact on angular momentum transport. Yeah, so yeah, jets are something I've not really talked about. Jets are also effective ways to get rid of magnum, uh, uh, angular momentum. But you know, to trigger the jet in the first place, right? you have to break the spherical symmetry, so you'll need a magnetic field or something Ask else. Ask tomorrow. Yeah. So, <laughs> OK, another question. There was one more question here, no? Yeah. Uh, Turn green. Yeah, there it goes. OK. Mm. Uh, so you were talking about how you think magnetic fields might might be important for angular momentum dissipation. So okay. I'm guessing that means that that uh, the viscous dissipation isn't isn't enough. Then is that what you are meaning by that? No, no, that no. That's not what I mean. But okay. there, there's a lot more phenomenology, mm -hmm. like jets and stuff that you see, that clearly indicate that you need magnetic fields. Uh, okay. yeah. So I mean, you can go far with the simple alpha prescription. Wouldn't you agree, Andrea? Quite far. Yeah, but I mean, <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, le let's have a couple yeah. more questions. Yes, please. OK. Um, so kind of going back to my original question, since these analytical models uh, mm. don't account for any initial angular momentum loss when the stream collides with itself, um, and many of, many of these galaxies' formation models use those same analytical models that you showed us. Um, how would, it seems as though the loss of angular momentum would feed the AGN and turn it on sooner. Um, I, I was just wondering if there have been any works that investigate the effects of that. Actually, you know, I don't know. We should ask one of the simulators, yeah, yeah, who's worked on this. Hmm. The angular momentum loss on entry to the galaxy is still or many orders of magnitude larger scale than the angular momentum sure. in the accretion disk. So yeah, that will tend to funnel gas towards the center <coughs> of the galaxy, but that means like the inner kiloparsec. Right. Whereas this is it, all when you're worried about scale. accretion disk physics, you're worried about the inner yeah. parsec. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think Romil just walked in. In simulations, well, I guess Roman, everybody's here, so and Lars is here. So, what is the scale that you guys are now resolving in terms of uh, the flow onto the black hole? Like, how close in are you getting at the moment? Hundred parsecs. Okay, so you know, I'm still oh, much larger. Than much, this. yeah, much okay, larger than this. Question? Uh, yes, please. <laughs> Oh yeah. So yeah, no. the uh, the main results that the emitted radiation from the disk is independent of the viscosity. I I kind of forgot about it, but I guess I must have known it a long time ago. But <laughs> that seems to imply some sort of self-regulation in the disk. But I th I fear that it's very dependent on, on that boundary condition at the it inner is. radius, which the is inner radius. Sort of free. Absolutely. So if it becomes non-sort free, then do you get a dependence on the viscosity, and can that help you estimate uh, the this mysterious viscosity. Yeah, I think the um, more than it helping you uh, decode what the viscosity is, what that actually helps you figure out is the flaring of the disk. So it tells you something about how the geometry gets altered when you have irradiation. So if you keep the viscosity prescription as it as is, then you can interpret the inclusion of the irradiation from the disk as just accounting for a flaring and a change in the geometry of the disk itself. OK, I think I'm afraid we have to cut okay. now. And so we thank Bria again for thank the very nice everyone. lecture. <laughs> and she will be delivering a second one tomorrow. Uh, so we have the, the group picture now before we go for coffee. And we reconvene at 11.30. <laughs>